Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Christ the Rock. Welcome to God's house. I'd say welcome back, but we're the ones who came back, so we're, we're, we're happy to be back and happy to be with you this morning and, and to be able to do the things that we do every Sunday, to focus on God's Word and to hear the wonderful things that God has for us today. In, our, in particular, this morning, we're going to focus on a, a hard word, the word persecution. The things that we face as a result of what we believe, the, the Savior that we follow, we're going to experience persecution and hardships and even hatred because of the Savior we believe. But God also has our response, and that's what we get to focus on this morning. Our, our order of worship this morning is printed out for you, as always, in the service folder. And we'll begin with our opening hymn, Fight the Good Fight. Uh, it will be up on the screen for you as well, and the version is our Koine version, and so it'll be pretty lively, so please join in singing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let's confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. So let's take a quiet moment for reflection and self-examination. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you, 
and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. And in response to that wonderful news, let's join in our song of praise, O oh, Taste and See. and say that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues forever. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. We join together in our responsive prayer of the day. Oh God, your presence always goes with us. Help us to see all the mercy and blessing you pour out on us every day as we meditate on everything you have done. Help us to live secure and content in your eternal love. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is recorded in Paul's second letter to his friend Timothy, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. This section also serves as the basis for our message today, and it really fits well with our opening hymn. Paul talks about the way he fought hard for the gospel, how he ran the race, how he kept the faith, and we just sang that too, because we do the same things by God's grace. I solemnly charge you, and he's speaking to Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready whether it's convenient or not. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with all patience and teaching. For there will come a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, because they have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in line with their own desires. They will also turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. As for you, keep a clear head in every situation. Bear hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. You see, I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness. The Lord, the righteous judge, will give it to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to everyone who loved his appearing. This is the word of our God. Let's join together in singing our alleluias, our praise the Lord. is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Our gospel for this morning is recorded in Matthew chapter 10, 
Verse, verse 5 and verses 21 to 33. You know, when Paul talked about endure hardship for the sake of the gospel when he was encouraging Timothy, Jesus makes it very clear that all Christians will face hardship because of his name. But also listen for his words of promise and strength as he encourages them and encourages us. So let's view Matthew chapter 10. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. This is the gospel of our Savior Jesus. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. At this time, I'll invite the children to come forward for the children's message. Awesome. Yay. Yay. All right. How many of you have ever heard a story or read a story about pirates? All right, Jazz has, and, and Landon has, and... Okay, so how do pirates talk? Arr, that's right, Jacob, they talk, with, they talk like this, R. So anytime you answer a question today, you have to answer R. okay? What do pirates like to, like to hide from everybody else? R. Gold. Gold, that's right, you gotta say R first, because we're pirates. I tell you what, how, how do they know where they keep, where they hid the gold? What do they have, to, what do they have Liam? Um, they keep it in their pirate Arr, there you go. Arr. All right, they have a treasure chest, and then how do you find the treasure chest? Arr. Arr. On an axe, on an axe. Dig. How do you know where to dig? Because the axe. Arr, there's a treasure map, me hearties. Well, I've got something for you to look at this morning. Take a look at the, the picture on the screen. What do you think that is? The X. X marks the spot. We need X marks so the spot. So where do we look for the X? There. I'll the treasure map. That's the map. What's it a map of? It's the church. Where would the treasure be in the church? Well, look at the map. Behind that. Uh, okay, Catalea thinks she knows. Go take a look. See if, it, see if there's a treasure there. Ah, 
Oh, she found the treasure. Bring it, bring it out, me hearty. How did you know it was a treasure? Because it had a giant. Because it has a big X on it. All right. So if it's a treasure chest with an X on it, what do you think is inside? Gold. Arr. Arr, treasure. Treasure. Can I see? Can I see? Gold. Open can I see? What else do you think Open it might be? A Bible. A Bible. A Bible. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, Take that paper off there. Oh, oh what did you find? Uh, you it? What did you find? Jacob, don't take all just, of them. Just take one, Jacob. Just, just take one. Pick one. Everybody pick um, I one. Need one for my aunt. Everybody pick one. I need one for my auntie. Everybody pick one. I need pick one. one back. There you go. I need Jacob. one for my auntie. Pick, pick one. Just take There you go. Good job. Everybody, hang on. Everybody got a treasure, but what? what's a better treasure than gold or silver? Jesus. Jesus. Hang on. Hang on. Everybody sit back down. Sit back down. There you go. Our greatest treasure, our priceless treasure is Jesus. Where are you going to find Jesus? That's a long ways away if he's in heaven. Where else are we going to find him? In the Bible. In the Bible, right here. When we listen to God's word, Jesus is right here with us. When you go to Sunday school, Jesus is right there with you. And so you have these little treasure crosses to remind you that Jesus is your greatest treasure. Okay, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for sending us the map of your word so that we can find the greatest treasure of all, that we can find you in the Bible. So Lord, help us to trust you so that one day we can be with you forever in heaven. We ask this all in your name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right. Head back to your seats, me hearties. <laughs> what a fun reminder. Nothing, there's nothing better than a treasure map. I know you all were wishing you could come find the treasure too, weren't you? All right, our next hymn takes this idea that Jesus is our priceless treasure and allows us to sing about it. So let's join in our hymn, Jesus, Priceless Treasure. I'll sing the first verse for you since the melody might not be familiar. If you'd like to join in on verse one, please feel free. Otherwise, join in on the following verses. Jesus, priceless treasure, fount of purest pleasure, truest friend to me. Ah, how long in anguish shall my spirit languish? Yearning, Lord, for thee, thou art mine, O Lamb divine. I will suffer not to hide thee, not I ask beside thee, not I ask beside thee. In thine arms I rest me, foes who would molest me, cannot reach me here, though the earth be shaking, every heart be quaking. Jesus comes my fear, lightnings flash and thunders crash, yet though sin and hell assail me, Jesus will not fail me, Jesus will not fail me. 
Satan, I defy thee. Death, I now decry thee. Fear, I bid thee cease. World, thou shalt not harm me, nor thy threats alarm me. While I sing of peace, God's great power guards every hour. Earth and all its depths adore him. Silent bow before him. Silent bow before him. Gone all fear and sadness. For the Lord of gladness, Jesus enters in. Those who love the Father, though the storms may gather, still have peace within. Yea, whate'er I hear must bear, thou art still my purest pleasure. Jesus, priceless treasure. Jesus, priceless treasure. God's grace and his mercy and his peace are yours. A gift, a treasure for us to have and to hold all because Jesus has given it so freely and so perfectly. God's word that we're going to focus on this morning are those words from 2 Timothy chapter 4. We've heard those already. They're printed for you in your service folder. If you'd like to use that to follow along, please feel free to do that. Let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, sanctify us. Make us holy by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. How many of you like stories? All right, I'm, I'm going to start with a story this morning, but it's not going to be a pirate story, so I don't have to use my pirate voice. It's not going to be, it's going to be a beautiful story, but also kind of a sad one. I want to introduce to you Warren and Donna Pett. There we go. Warren and Donna Pett. In 1997, they decided to sell the family farm of 96 acres, sell the 110 head of Holstein cattle at their farm in McGuanago, Wisconsin, because they really felt that God wanted them to serve in a mission. And so they figured they could take their agricultural knowledge and teach African youths how to have a farm, how to grow things, how to take care of livestock. So they left behind children, a grandchild, their parents, other relatives who lived around the farm and made the tra trek to Uganda, a place called the Uembe District. Now, the Uembe District was the one district in Uganda that was not Christian, it was Muslim. They were going to be teaching at a school called Here is Life. Shortly after they began teaching at the school, the director, whose name was Isaac Anguo, received a threat from local Islamic leaders. You see, people's minds were being changed by the gospel. Christianity was starting to grow in the children and then in the parents, and they wanted the school shut down. Well, the school continued to, to stay open. The teachers continued to teach until on March 18th, 2004, two armed gunmen, faces covered, wearing military clothing and carrying machine guns, walked into the campus. When they knocked on Warren's door, he opened it 
and they forced him and his wife out into the open, forced them to kneel down, and killed them. It's a beautiful story. It's a sad story. It is the story of Christianity. What happens when people follow Jesus? That's what Jesus was talking about in our gospel reading this morning. He told us, here's what happens when you disciples follow me. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. In other words, how persecuted were his disciples going to be? Wherever they went, wherever they took the gospel, people would hate them, people would persecute them. That's what Warren and Donna experienced. It hasn't changed in all of the centuries since Jesus first warned his disciples. Following Jesus is a life or death matter. Maybe you noted in the service introduction that every day 12 Christians around somewhere in the world are either arrested or imprisoned because of their faith. And every day 13 Christians are martyred, they're killed because they refuse to deny that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. Being a Christian is oftentimes a matter of life and death. But not for us. Because where do we live? The United States. And what freedom do we have? We have the freedom of religion guaranteed to us in the United States Constitution. You remember which amendment it is? It's the first one, which is really cool. It's the first one. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So what can we do? Lily? We can be Christian or whatever religion we want. Yeah, really, we can choose whatever one we want. And as Christians, what do we get to do then? What we're doing today, we are gathered publicly in a place everybody can see and we can praise God as boldly and as loudly and as openly as we want. We can sing hymns about him. We can tell others about him. We can share him with others. Or can we? Persecution doesn't rely on rules like this. There are countries that don't have a beautiful law saying you have the freedom to worship and so their persecution reigns openly, blatantly. But persecution also knows how to shift and change depending on the time and the place. And so we endure persecution as God's people today here in the United States. It just tends to be quite a bit more subtle and hidden. That's what the Apostle Paul was getting at when he offered three bits of warning to his friend Timothy. He started off by saying this, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. It didn't take long for that to happen to Timothy. As a pastor, he had to face people saying, I don't believe that, I'm not gonna follow that, that's wrong. Has that time come today? It's, it hasn't changed. It's always been there. I'm, I'm going to guess that you know the answer to this, but June has been set aside as a celebration. What's it called? Pride Month. It's called Pride Month. And it's an opportunity for the LGBTQ community to say, this is who we are. This is what we do. This is how we live. These are the choices that we make. And they put it out there for everyone to see. Not necessarily a bad thing in the world, right? To just say, this is, this is what we believe. Because we do that too. But the problem begins with that word pride. A couple of weeks ago, we heard what God had to say about pride through the Apostle James. He said, God opposes the proud 
And regardless of what kind of pride that is, he says it's wrong. So my pride is just as bad as Pride Month. And what, are, what is the proudness about? It's about life choices that are different from what God's word says. And so, what are they doing? They are not putting up with sound doctrine. And so when God says what a beautiful thing it is for a man and a woman to be husband and wife, when he talks about the choices that we make with our sexuality, God says there is a, a good and, and right way and it's what I'm sharing with you. And some say, no, I don't want that. And it's their choice. We struggle with it too, don't we? We struggle with all kinds of choices. It's not just about human sexuality. Part of the challenge with Pride Month is the push for everyone to simply accept and believe. That's hard too. As we do that, Paul, Paul warns there comes another step with this, not putting up with what the truth is, so then instead to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And so who do people gather to listen to for advice? Doctors? Lawyers, random guy. random guy on the internet, <laughs> internet uh, university professors, uh, spiritual leaders. And the message is a good one. It's a beautiful one. God is love. Right? Everybody agree? Yeah, God is love. And Jesus said it like this. He said, God so loved the world. So who does God love? Everyone without exception. It doesn't matter what your political leanings are, what your personal choices are, what you decide to do with your body. God loves you. God loves everyone. But then those itching ears say, you know, I want God to tell me that my choices are all good and they're all acceptable. This is the way I want to live and so I want God to approve of it rather than me to approve of what God says. And so I'll make my choices and tell the rest of the world, I'm not going to listen to what God has to say. And so finally then, God's word is shifted. This beautiful message of God is love, Paul says, then they'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Do you know what a myth is? Lily? Lily? Okay, it's, it's a, a story, right? It's a made-up story. It has no basis in truth. And so what happens with that beautiful phrase, God is love, and for God so loved the world? The world turns it into a myth and says, now it's no longer God is love, but love is love. It's a story that we have made up. Starts with the truth, but it is eventually changed into something that is not the truth. Now, we've talked a lot about the world, right? Paul, Paul refers to the world as they. Here comes the hard word. Us. What do our itching ears want to hear about our choices? I want to hear that God accepts everything I decide to do, no matter what it is. Because he is loving and forgiving, so no matter what I do, he has to forgive me. So I can choose whatever I want to watch when nobody's looking, to binge on Netflix, to explore on the internet. I can look at whatever it is because God is love. He loves me. I don't have to worry about letting my temper blow against my coworkers or against my spouse or my children or my neighbor because pff, God is love. And he's got to forgive me. In fact, he's got to forgive me because I'm here. I'm in church. I believe in Jesus. Doesn't God have to be love? That's what my ears tell me. And doesn't that make me just as guilty as anyone else? There isn't one sin that God looks at and says is worse than the others or greater than the others. God's word is very clear. His sound doctrine says 
all people are sinful. All people are guilty. All people are worthy of eternal separation from Him. All. And it starts with me. And that's what hurts the most, doesn't it? Because every time I look in the mirror, I have to say, I am not perfect. I'm a sinful human being, just like everybody else. Everybody here loves to hear that, right? Ooh, we're going, yeah, this is fantastic. No, it, it hurts, it's, it's hard. But then Paul gives some wonderful advice to Timothy so that he knows how to work with his people when they're struggling with their choices and their lives and their troubles and their hurts and, yes, even persecution. He says, Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom. Just a little bit of background on Timothy. Timothy was a young man that Paul met on his second missionary journey. He had gone to the cities of Lystra and Derbe. And there he finds this young man whose mother and grandmother had raised him to believe. They had taught him the truths of the faith. And Paul was so impressed that he invited Timothy to come with him on the rest of the journey. And that became, became a lifelong friendship. Such a close friendship that Paul would later on, on call him his son. My son in the faith. I solemnly charge you. Timothy, this is serious. It's so serious that I'm going to call on God as my witness and Jesus Christ who is coming back to judge the living and the dead. Listen to what I have to say. And then he lays it on this young pastor. Preach the word. Don't preach public opinion. Don't preach the acceptance that the world wants you to preach. Don't preach what you think or believe. Preach the word. And so what does your pastor have to do today? It's the same solemn charge. God calls on me to preach the word to you. And so I start on Monday morning and I look at what's going to be the focus for the next Sunday and what does God want his people to hear from him? What's the truth? What's the sound doctrine he wants them to believe? And then on Tuesday, I get together with four or five other pastors online and we translate the Greek or the Hebrew and we dig into it and we study and we share and we wrestle with it. And then on Thursday, as I start to outline my thoughts, I listen to a podcast that's focusing on that section from God's Word. And then on Saturday morning, I'm finally ready to start writing. It's all in God's Word. That's where every message has to come from. I won't tell you I think or I believe because then I'm off track. This is God's word to you. Preach the word, Timothy. Be ready. In season and out of season, the King James says, whether it's convenient or not. It's not always convenient to preach the word. Pastors get tired, they fall asleep. They get sick. They take a vacation. But God reminds me, be ready to preach the word whether you're ready for this opportunity or not. So when someone calls, don't say, oh, they're calling again. But how can I serve them? What, what hurt do they have? What need are they expressing? What prayer do they want? And then I need to take the time to do it, whether it's convenient or not, because it's not about me. It's about God's word and what you need to hear. So don't ever be afraid to call pastor and say, Pastor, I need something. So many of you say, oh, I can't do it. You're, you're so busy. <laughs> no, no. I am ready in season and out of season, whether it's convenient or not. That's my job. That's my privilege. So ask me. Preach the word. Be prepared whether it's convenient or not. And then he says some of the hard words. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. That's part of my responsibility too as we deal with each other and with the world around us. Correct means get you back on track. 
Sometimes we, we start to head in the wrong direction or we, we have the wrong idea in our head. So it's my job from God's word to say, no, that's, that's not quite right. Let's, let's look here. Let's read this. Let's study this. Here's the answer. Rebuking is a little harder. Anybody know what the word rebuke means? It's what mom and dad have to do when we've been naughty. Right? Yeah, Juanita's got it. Stop it. You are wrong. It's the finger wagging. You shouldn't be doing that. Let's stop and let's do something right. Let's do something good. So basically the word is repentance. My job is to lead you to repentance. So if I see you doing something that's wrong, I'm supposed to say, please don't do that. Because here's what God says. Not because I say it, because God says it. And I can't forget to encourage you because life is hard. Everybody agree? Life is hard? Yeah. And there are times that we just need a pick-me-up. And you can ask me for that. Pastor, I've had a hard week. Give me some word. Give me some encouragement. And I can say, here, here's what God says. Here's what God promises. And best of all, I can point you to Jesus. Because how much does Jesus love you? Yeah, it's priceless. Just like we heard with the kids, right? It's a treasure. And you can't buy it. There's no price you could ever pay for it. And it's ours. And it's brand new every morning, every day we get up. That's our encouragement. That's what I get to share with you every single day. So if you need it, ask for it. I'll share it. Paul reminds Timothy and reminds me as pastor too, there's always an umbrella covering all of this preaching and teaching. He says, do this with all patience and with teaching. With all patience and with teaching. Sometimes people like to think that pastors are here and everybody else is here. Not true. I'm no better or worse, no more or less perfect. We're all in this together. And so that's a reminder for me too, to remember that I'm not better. So my, uh, my job is to share with you the truth of God's word and to point out what God has done for you. To teach you the blessings that Jesus has poured out, what he was willing to do for us. And always keeping the final goal in mind. Paul said it so beautifully to his friend. He said, You see, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I have kept the faith. Does anybody know where Paul was when he wrote these words? He's in prison. This is the last time he's in, the first time he was in prison in the city of Rome, he was a house prisoner. He could, he could have visitors, he could write, he could, he could basically do just about anything he wanted except leave by himself. Now he is in the Mamertine prison, which is the most brutal place a Roman prisoner could be held. He was literally in a hole in the ground. And he says, I am being poured out like a drink offering. That was the last part of an individual sacrifice to the Lord at the temple. They would get the animal ready, the priests would place it on the altar, and then the individual would pour out his cup of wine on the sacrifice, and then it would be set on fire. That was it, and he was done. Paul said, my time here is, is over. He had been on trial, and apparently the trial hadn't gone well because he would be executed. It's time for my departure. Literally said, it's time for me to pull up stakes, gather my belongings, and head off for my final destination. I have fought the good fight, and Paul had fought harder than anyone else to make sure that the truth about Jesus Christ would be proclaimed. He'd finished the race, he talked earlier in his letters about training his body to keep running, to cross the finish line, to keep his eyes focused on Jesus and Jesus alone. And Paul had done that. He had kept the faith. He had guarded and protected the truth that he would proclaim wherever he went, that the only thing that mattered was Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
crucified for the sins of the world. Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead for our justification so that you and I could be declared 100% innocent, perfect. And that is what we are. And that is what Paul held on to. And all for the prize. Because when you finish the fight and you win, when you cross the finish line and you win, there's always a prize. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness. The Lord, the righteous judge, will give it to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to everyone who loved his appearing. Paul was far from perfect. Does anyone remember the nickname he gave himself? Call himself a worm of a man, yep. Yeah. Chief of sinners, the worst, the worst. And yet what did Jesus have prepared for him? The crown of perfection. Not something that Paul had earned or deserved as the chief of sinners he couldn't have, but Jesus gave it to him. Is there a crown waiting for you and me? Paul says there is for everyone who loved his appearing. And he's talking about Jesus. For everyone who loved Jesus' appearance here on earth, who believed that he came as their Lord and Savior to rescue them from every sin. And that's why Jesus came. So that he, he might prepare a crown of righteousness for everyone in the entire world. So he has one prepared for everyone who celebrates Pride Month. He has a crown prepared for everyone who struggles with some sort of pet sin, whether it be lust or anger or lying or whatever it is. Whatever sin has enslaved us, Jesus came to set us free so that he might place that perfect crown on our heads when we cross the finish line. That's the privilege of a Christian pastor in the holy ministry. To be able to proclaim this incredible truth day in and day out. To share with you the joy of our salvation that follows that terrible reckoning of God's justice and perfection. This joy that we have only in Jesus. Amen. This peace and love and joy that Jesus brings, I pray that will cover your hearts and minds now and always. Amen. This time we have the opportunity to confess our Christian faith. We'll use the Apostles' Creed as it's printed in your service folder on page 9. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the, from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time we have the opportunity to bring our offerings of thanks to Jesus for all that he's done for us.
This time we have the opportunity to bring our prayer requests before the Lord. We have a list of those prayers in our service folder on page 12. Also a special request on behalf of Audrey Armenta, who's struggling with her diabetes. And for Leroy Jean Garcia, who has blood pressure and stomach issues. Are there any other requests that you'd like to add this morning? Okay, sister, and, and what was her name, Juanita? Marjorie, okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Any other ones? All right, then would you please stand and join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, every week, every day, we face opposition from the world around us. And you warned us that it would happen that people would hate us because they hate you, that they would persecute us just as they persecuted you. Lord, give us strength and confidence that just like you take care of the little sparrows, we are worth so much more to you. And you will stand with us and guide us and guard us every step of the way. Lord, we pray that you'd continue to watch over our congregation as we carry out this beautiful gospel ministry. Help us to keep supporting that ministry with our gifts and talents and offerings. Watch over all of our young adult members here at Christ the Rock. Strengthen their faith and encourage them to come back to the family of believers if they've strayed. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you showered on Mitch Thomas throughout his life. As you've called him home now, Lord, we pray for comfort for his wife and daughter, for his family and friends. Give them the hope that only you can give. Please watch over Mona's grandson, Ryan, and his family as they spend time at their camp in New Jersey. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, and please continue to watch over Ryan and his health needs. Continue to be with Laurel's nephews, Thomas and Mark, for her daughter, April, as she deals with, with her health issues. Help and heal each one of them. Thank you for Matt's call to serve in the teaching ministry. Guide all of his preparations to teach. Bring light and hope to those who are struggling in darkness. Comfort to those who are wounded in body and spirit. Fill them with your perfect love. Watch over Dre's father, Colby, Linda, Willie, Kurt, Marjorie, and anyone else, Lord, who needs your help and your healing. Grant them strength and recovery. Finally, Lord, be with Aaron's daughter, Brittany. Help her to hear your voice call and know that she can always come home to her Heavenly Father. We ask all these things in your name, Lord, and we join together in the prayer that you taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. As we close today, once again, we have the words of the Lord's blessing, his own words and promises that wherever we go, he puts his name on us so we know that he is with us too. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Jesus is the one who gives us his word and the ability to follow it. So let's share his praises with him. your tribute bring ransomed healed restored forgiven evermore his praises sing alleluia alleluia praise the everlasting king 
praise Him for His grace and favor to His people in distress. Praise Him still the same as ever, slow to chide and swift to bless. Alleluia, Alleluia, glorious in His faithfulness. <coughs> Father, like He tends and spares us, well our feeble frame He knows. In His hand He gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Alleluia, Alleluia, widely yet His mercy flows. Angels help us to adore Him, you behold him face to face. Sun and moon bow down before him, ill who dwell in time and space. Alleluia, alleluia, praise with us the God of grace. Once again, good morning. Welcome to all of you. What a blessing it is to be able to share the, the Word of God with you this morning and to celebrate all that He's done for us. This morning we have our June Wells Connection to watch, and it's, it's really an interesting one because it talks about the same kinds of things we're doing here at Christ the Rock, trying to reach out, build connections with our community. So let's watch. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Our Synod has adopted the goal of planting 100 new home missions and enhancing 75 existing missions in the next 10 years. That effort has already begun. And these new missions are planning their ministries to create opportunities to tell their neighbors about Jesus. Here's one example of a church that's beginning to do just that in Durham, North Carolina. Walking with God all the time through your life is transformative. And if you want to have an impact on the world right around you, there's no better way to do that than sharing Jesus with somebody. This group hasn't yet launched public worship. As they prepare to, they're temporarily worshiping in their pastor's living room. And he says to you today, I forgive you. They were sent to Durham from a Wells church about 20 miles away in Raleigh to explore planting a new church in this growing area. Because of what you have done, Lord, we have nothing to fear. <laughs> in order to do that, the group has been diligently trying to meet their neighbors and learn how to best reach them with the gospel. My son, who's seven, plays baseball. He plays Little League. And um, we made a very intentional decision to move him from the league that he had played in for three seasons to a league that's based in Durham. And, um, you know, for us, we live very close to communities in both Raleigh and Durham. And so we looked at the situation and we said, this will allow us the opportunity to um, be part of a Durham community and get to know people there better. And as a group, they have been volunteering with various nonprofit groups in Durham to meet the people that they are hoping to reach. We've just been trying to get into the city and just make those connections and just really get to know people in the area um, and, make, and try to make connections off of connections and just network that way to really just learn about the area and what's going to work here. As they come to understand the cultural makeup of their community and what its needs and concerns are, they are able to move into the practical steps necessary in order to launch their ministry publicly. Hey, sir. Hey. Oh, ready for 
So I would say we're moving along in kind of a logical, actionable sequence of, okay, now we need to have a space so that when we do go out and we invite people, where are we going to invite them to come to? So, you know, we're starting to go through those steps. And then there's just planning conversations happening. Um, and eventually that's going to turn into more action. All of this work behind the scenes is happening with their neighbors in mind and how they can best serve the lost souls in Durham. We're just, by nature, we're not good listeners. By nature, we don't want to contextualize. We want them to understand us and, and hear what I'm saying and get into my shoes instead of, I want to walk a mile in yours. I want to understand what it's like to be a 20-year-old African-American growing up in Durham, North Carolina. Or I want to understand what it's like to be a 34-year-old tech woman who moved from Silicon Valley to here because they all got an interesting stories and they all got different perspectives so that when we start talking Jesus, we, we can hit them where, where they need to hear it. Despite being located in what's traditionally referred to as the Bible Belt, Pastor Lang says that 70% of the people in this area are not currently connected to a church. They're not hearing the good news of Jesus. They're not hearing about the hope that they can have. Maybe they just never heard it. Nobody ever told them. Um, but we have an opportunity to do that, to tell them ab about a Savior who loves them, a Savior who died for them. And if we can start to shine lights into the darkness, this place will become a place of light. We want to make decisions not based on the people who are here, but based on the people we're trying to reach for Christ. So in other words, what am I willing to give up? Am I willing to set aside my ego, my pride, my wants, my desires, the way I think a church should be run so that that person might know Jesus better and see their Savior? We ask the Holy Spirit to bless that, and God will bless it as He wills, and we trust that. All that we know is He told us to go, and so we need to go. Wells hopes to plant many other home mission churches over the next 10 years, much like this mission in Durham, that'll uniquely reach their neighbors with the life-saving message of the gospel of Christ. You can learn more about the 100 New Missions in 10 Years effort and how you can get involved at wells110.net.